So thank you all very much for being here at this uh, second lecture of business technology and innovation. Um, despite the beautiful weather, uh, great that you still can attend. Um, today, uh, we're going to talk about more about innovation uh, and about innovation typologies and innovation management. And if we have time left, we will talk a bit about open innovation. And if not, we'll do that next week or maybe the week after. Um, before we start, uh, remember if you have not signed up for a group yet, or um, if you want to switch groups, uh, you also can you have to do that before September 12th, because then we're going to make the final list of who is participating in the course. Um, if you um, see that you're in a group with only one of two people, um, you can check if there are other groups with other places available and see if you can join those groups. If you cannot find a group or if you uh, remain all by yourself if you and if you don't want that let me know and i can see if i can find a group uh, for you okay so well what we did yesterday yesterday last week we um uh, discussed well, basically, we talked a bit about the course and what we'll be doing during the course and after the break and the formalities, we had a short discussion about what is innovation um, and what's the difference from in, between an invention and an innovation. And well, we came to the conclusion that an innovation, basically innovation is something new, innovation is something that also sells. So something new coupled with value, with a market entry, with value creation. And usually an innovation builds on top of other innovations. Um, so an invention is the creation of a thing or our ability for the first time. An innovation is using that to create impact. Um, like I said last week, generally we talk here about things like market and profit, etc. But um, it's entirely possible to have an innovation in, uh, in a non-profit or governmental or whatever type of organization. Um, so it doesn't necessarily have to be like market entry, uh, even but not also, even in non-profit you define the markets, but it doesn't, doesn't necessarily have to be geared towards commercial organizations. Okay. So these were the definitions we have, um, but I think it's best to switch to and uh, to start with this let's say the innovation process. So um, what exactly happens in an organization from well, if you want to innovate? Well, um, if you Google innovation process or, or uh, inventions in organizations, you get a lot of images like this on screen. And you, you get a lot of, this is called the I-5 process, but you have like a thousand different models, so you don't have to remember this uh, at all. Um, but what you do have to remember is that basically there are certain stages in, an in, uh, in the innovation process, which usually starts with you know, um, coming up with a problem and then a solution uh, and then finding a solution to that problem and then implementing it. So you have like general stages of, okay, we need to invent something and then, then we need to um, and then, then we need to well, diffuse that and we need to um, incorporate that in the organization and that's the innovation part so here they have identification investigation ideation impact and implementation because it all starts with an i and it's cool um, but you have different ways of defining it. Um, for our purposes i think the the best way of defining this is, is done in the uh, um, uh, chapter one by the paper by smith i think the book by smith um, which defines innovation, well, basically a process consisting of three separate stages. So first of all, you have an exploration process and an exploitation and then a diffusion process. So exploration is basically the innovation process within the organization. It's, it's um, the, um, the awareness that, that you need to innovate, the awareness that there is a problem, the awareness that there may be a need in the market that is new, um, basically awareness that you have to do something new, and then coming up with a solution, inventing something technical or whatever, um, and then building the organization around it. That is the exploration stage of the innovation. 
The next stage is exploitation, which means basically, okay, we, we think that we as an organization have a good idea or a good invention. Um, now we hope that we can actually um, create it in something that sells, again, add value to it. Um, that is basically creating the business model around your innovation. Um, and we'll discuss that in two weeks. And then finally, you have the diffusion stage of the innovation in which you hope that the innovation will spread, spread uh, throughout the market. And the market doesn't, doesn't necessarily have to be everyone, like every consumer, every person, um, but spreading throughout the market can also be you know, that everyone within your niche adapts the innovation. But basically diffusion starting from uh, you know, one person who's willing to adopt your innovation to everyone who you are interested in adopting the innovation. And that's the diffusion process. And more about that next week. Uh, so now we focus mostly on the um, on innovation management in the organization and the innovation process in the organization. Uh, so we focus on the um, exploration stage. If I go too quickly or too slow, or if you have any questions in the meantime, feel free to interrupt or put it in the chat, by the way. Um, so there are several ways that the innovation process in an organization can start. Um, and usually, well, let me start with the next slide. If you look at, if you, compare innovation and invention to the movies, uh, to what you see in the movies or what you um, read in popular and, and fiction literature, innovation is, and invention is basically always, you know, one single person working on something technical in his, usually his garage and then coming up with a completely new idea. Um, so like a prototypical, weird genius working on something. Um, so, and we consider in invention to be some kind of creative process uh, belonging to a certain individual with a certain personality who then creates something. Well, this is not how inventions happen. I believe may maybe it was how it, how it was like 500 years ago, but nowadays in modern day organizations. This just doesn't regularly happen. Maybe once in a while there's a breakthrough, but almost always innovation is a group process. So there's a there are whole departments or the whole organization is involved in uh, creating something new. That's why you have research and development departments in an organization. That's why we have universities in which people work together on different projects. Um, but you, but an in, invention uh, and and the whole innovation bus may even start outside of the organization, you know, but with someone else having an ID, um, but being unable to bring it to market, you just buy in the innovation or that you learn something, you know, you, know, you see something in a magazine or something like that. So uh, innovation can even start outside your organization. Um, let me get back to this one in a minute. But usually with an, um, when the innovation starts, you need to have some kind of um, trigger process, uh, a trigger event, or um, yeah, a trigger event. So something needs to happen in your organization that, 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 that starts the um, innovation process. And there can be a lot of different trigger events. So um, it can actually be assigned different breakthrough. So something uh, your R&D department uh, learns from a uh, scientific journal, for example. Uh, it can be that your organization is not, well, near death and you um, really have to innovate in order to survive. Um, it can be a, you know, a scientific and technological breakthrough. It can be a brilliant idea from something, someone or a couple of persons in your organization. Um, it can also be something you observe in society. So for example, okay, we observe that there's climate change, maybe we can innovate in order to do something with that. Um, so those are the examples of trigger events that you have, which start the whole innovation process. 
Um, and you can also have ID triggers like a lone ranger, you know, which is the weird scientist or someone else who has a brilliant ID in your organization. It can also be your R&D department or it can be outside of the organization, like an open innovation process in which people from outside the organization help you with uh, starting um, to come up with a solution for a problem or even starting defining the problem. Um, so those are all kinds of ways that the in, um, innovation process can, uh, can start. Um, and basically when you think about it, what we'll come back to that in uh, uh, next week, um, an innovation can basically start because there is really something new that you observe, some new technology um, or some, some um, change in society, um, but an innovation can also be spurred even before you observe a new technology or service. For example, that you identify a certain need in consumers. So you say, well, uh, consumers, uh, there, I think consumers have a basic need for, you know, whatever. Um, and then you try to invent a new product or service around it. I cannot come up with a good example now. But I think if I could, I would be very rich. Um, but we'll have some examples of it uh, uh, in a couple of months. So in general, innovation is a group process. So you have the lone ranger idea here, which can be, which, which could happen, but not often. Usually it is your R&D department or other people in or outside of your organization who work together collectively in order to um, create something new. Um, and we'll get to that further in detail in a moment, but innovation is um, also depends on the affordances or characteristics of your organization. So um, innovation in an organization can only happen when you have the human capital, the knowledge available in your organization, uh, when your strategy and structure and culture of the organization matches the type of innovation you want to develop. So. Um, an organization's capabilities for innovation also really depend on the organization itself, of course. I, I, I am recording this lecture. Uh, <laughs> you made me worried for a moment, but I already started the recording. So this is getting back to uh, to the, the one of the first slides I uh, uh, to the first slide of discussion. So the process of an innovation organization is, is moving from uh, idea via um, object to practice. So first of all, you have a kind of an ID stage in an organization. So your research and development uh, or your marketing department comes up with with new ideas to invent something new. Then you create something new, which is called the object, but the object doesn't necessarily always have to be a physical object. It can also be a surface. Um, and then you try to um, turn that object into practice. So you actually develop something and you try to scale it up. So basically first there is a kind of an ID, then you um, start developing the ID. So there are is some kind of object, you know, an actual prototype or a product or service, and then you try to um, turn it into practice and try to market it. And like the, the general rule of an organization, of innovation organization, is that you have like a thousand different ideas, of which a hundred are feasible, of which ten turn into an object, like a concept, um, and one of those thousand actually becomes a product, and then still. It has to be on integrated in people's everyday life. So even then you won't know if it will be a success. But usually the innovation process is a lot of different ideas and only very, very few actually making it into an actual innovation. Which is called the innovation funnel, um, which basically is um, a lot of different ideas and then um, 
fewer make it into a proposal, fewer in a prototype, fewer into commercialization, and only very, very few into actual results. So an in invention are the ideas, to, and, and then later on, once you think about prototyping, commercialization results, it becomes a kind of an invention. But I must admit that the lines here are pretty blurred. So there's the innovation funnel in the organization. Any questions? If not, I'll continue. Um, later on in the lecture, we'll be talking a bit more about innovation and innovation management in an organization. And we'll talk about what, what you need as an organization in order to uh, stimulate innovation. Uh, but now, uh, I want to discuss several types of innovation. Um, there are many types and typologies of innovation. And um, here we discuss a few. Um, so for example, this is a, I don't even remember where I got the slide from, but th this distinguishes between one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 different types of um, innovation into four major dimensions. So a business model innovation is, uh, for example, um, uh, well, it may now not seem so revolutionary, but Dell was the first company which offered um, consumers to, um, in, to, to um, actually choose the exact computer system you want and then get it shipped to you in one or two weeks or so. And now you think, oh, well, why would I need that? I can just pick one of like a thousand different laptops. But when Dell started it, it was really revolutionary. Usually you had to go to a physical store and then buy one of, um, uh, and then buy one of the different available uh, computers. But Dell was the first one who really changed their entire business model and um, really aimed towards the consumer market with their, um, with their business model. I'll come back to that later. Uh, um, well, and networks and alliances, for example, is how you work together with other organizations and uh, innovate in the way that you to collectively together offer products or services. Um, optimizing your process is, um, is, is seeing if you can optimize, for example, your logistics in your organization, like innovate, fast delivery, uh, things like that, um, or fast manufacturing, sorry. Offering is different innovation in different types of products or services. And then finally, delivery is innovations in, well, in, in how you interact with your customers. So there are like many different examples here of, um, uh, of different types of innovation. But I think it's best if you classify them into four major types of innovation. And that is something you would have to remember for the exam. This. Um, so th these are four major types of innovation we distinguish. Uh, if you read the uh, literature for this week, they only distinguish between product, service, and process. Um, but in other literature, I think this is more useful for this um, for us. Um, is that they um, classify innovation into the four P's of innovation? Um, again, four P's because. Easy to remember. Um, so the first one they have is product service or innovation. You know, th this is the whole invention thing, the product innovation. The product innovation is just inventing a new device or thingy for um, uh, that people can can use. Um, and I classify that into product and service innovation um, uh, because this has the has the uh, least impact on your organization. Um, so this is creating something new, delivering a new product or service. I have a couple of examples on the next slide. Um, but you can also innovate a process. Um, like here on the previous slides, there are a lot of different examples of uh, innovating in a, a process. Um, so you can innovate, um, you, can innov you can innovate, for example, the well, your operational process, you can innovate the way you uh, deliver your product or service to customers, um, et cetera. 
examples following soon. You can also innovate your business model. Business model does not start with a P, but it's called officially position. Um, so you can try to focus on a new market. So you can, for example, have something that is not new, but which you try to sell to a different market, which is also a type of innovation. So selling something which is which already exists to a new consumer group. And finally, um, you can innovate in your paradigm. And this is basically strategy innovation. This is really redesigning what you do as an organization. Um, so for example, if you think of um, uh, maybe, well, think of Videoland here in the Netherlands or uh, what Blockbuster failed to do and Netflix kind of did is that previously you considered yourself as a something so as a company that really delivered products i think of blockbusters you could rent a video but you but what you rented was the actual physical videotape so you rented a physical product nowadays the organization has turned much more into a um, to a video on the netflix they they are really platforms on which content is offered and you can watch content so it required a, um, a redesign of the organization strategy uh, so that's the paradigm or strategy innovation. Um, yeah, so Evelyn, you're absolutely right. Are the product, service, and process also not a part of the business model? Yes, there is a huge oh, not huge. There is an overlap between all these types of innovation. So usually, when you talk about a business model innovation, you you also talk about a process and or product service innovation. Yeah. And a product service innovation sometimes, but not always, also entails thinking about the business model. But not always. So, um, for example, you can innovate incrementally. So you can have minor innovations in a product you already have. And that way you don't really innovate in a new business model. You just, you just have a, you know, a new version of a laptop. Um, which is innovative because it has a new pro pro processor and then maybe it's uh, it's waterproof or whatever, um, but still the business model is the same. So the, the product has some minor innovations, but you still sell it to the same type of people. Um, so sometimes product and service is part of the business model, but not always. More examples in the moment. So this actually is not, not a very useful picture, but let me explain what a product innovation. So a, a product innovation is really a, a physical object. So a product innovation is you know, the first person who in the photo, for example, the first iPhone, that was really a product innovation. So um, it combined different technologies that were already sort of available and combined that into a phone with a touch screen. Um, you know, the invention of the compact disc um, uh, virtual reality goggles, um, um, electric cars, whatever. So those are all physical products, objects, physical objects that are um, innovative. So they are a new technology or a new type of technology. Um, but they, are, of course, have to bring change. So you have, of course, if you have a minor in, you can have a minor innovation, but you want people to adopt that innovation as well. So there is kind of a relative, and so, so every innovation means that there is a kind of a relative advantage to the previous uh, version. So think of a new version of a phone, there is a relative advantage because it has a new camera or, or a better screen or whatever. But I, oh, oh, oh. Sorry, sorry, sorry. A uh, service innovation is well, similar to a product innovation, except there is no physical product. You know, think, um, think a new concept, um, a new 
customer interface and your delivery system. Um, so I think supermarket delivery um, actually entails different, uh, uh, also entails physical products, but it is now delivered to you. So it's a new service. Although you could classify this as a new business model as well, um, because there are new organizations who um, try to, um, with a new business model, try to have a say in the market. So, for example, I think for Albert Heijn, the biggest supermarket here in the Netherlands, um, supermarket delivery would basically be a um, service innovation. You know, you could do your groceries at the store, but you can you could also do your groceries online and we deliver them to you. But for example, for an organization like Crisp, um, don't know if you know Crisp, but Crisp is like picnic, but then focused on biological local products. Um, for them, it's their business model. So it's delivery with specific local biological products. Um, you know, about service innovation, you know, a new way of delivering goods to you, uh, a new way of uh, cutting your hair, uh, a new, new types of financial products, um, and, and a new way of banking um, are all examples of service innovation. Um, so that's one, service products innovation. Another, um, so the next type of innovation is, uh, if you remember, product service process innovation. A second example of an innovation is a, a process innovation. That, that's if you, as an organization, look at the way that, that the processes within your organization are organized. Um, so I already gave the example um, from Dell, um, but I think it's a bit old, but it's the most clear example of a process innovation. So usually computer manufacturers used to just simply make computers and then sell them in a store. And there was no, there was only a few options. And Dell was the first one who said, well, we first wait for the customer to order a certain computer with certain, with certain uh, hardware and software. And only then we will re uh, relay the order to manufacturing, then they will manufacture it, and then we will deliver it to the customer. Um, and that was a completely new way of, um, of, of of organizing their, their internal business. So instead of simply um, building computers, selling them, it was waiting for customers to order a computer, then building them, then shipping them. Um, so this was an example of a process innovation. And uh, they were the first one who, who, uh, um, who came up with the idea of selling computers that way. Um, But you can think of uh, Netflix as a, you know, it's, it's both a certain Netflix is both a service and a process innovation. So it's a service innovation because for you, it, it is easier to watch movies and series online. So instead of going to a physical store, store and renting a video or um, um, you using MuTorrent to download it, it's a relatively cheap and easy way to watch uh, movies. Not only Netflix, but like the thousand different uh, apps we have now, Disney, Google, whatever. Um, so it's a new service, but it's always it's, it's also a new process. You know, it's 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 not it's not simply um, having access to the physical DVDs or the physical videos and renting them out. No, it's um, um, having to have contracts with all the major content providers, then having a way of getting that digital content into your digital store and then finding a way, uh, the easiest way for people to actually watch that content. So it's also an example of a, um, um, of a, of a, different, yeah, a different process in an organization. And I don't know, does any of you remember how Netflix originally started out? 
That allows me to check the second bar. Mm -hmm. Yes. You could actually rent physical DVD. So Netflix started out as a physical DVD renting company. So you could you could still order online, um, or but you would get the DVD delivered by mail, you know, actual physical mail. So you get a DVD in your post delivered by mail, and you watch it, and you would send the DVD back. Um, so that was how they started, and then they were the first to realize, well, well, maybe there is a more efficient way of doing that. Now that more and more people have access to broadband internet, and then they came up with the online service, which is really an example of a of a change in basically every type of innovation that they had. Yeah, and I think now there's only a single video take or blockbuster left in the US. Uh, I think it was in Alaska. Um, so I think another, if you look at um, uh, a surface and a process innovation, um, the, those modern delivery services like Gorillas and Jetier and the other ones who um, uh, who deliver groceries to you within 15 minutes. I think it's also an example of a, ah, I was in Bend, Oregon. Ah, thanks. That was the last one. Potatoes. Um, I don't know what you, what, what do you think? Is potatoes a service innovation? Um, or is it not an innovation at all? Or is it a process innovation or a business model innovation? What do you think? Yeah. So I, I think so too. I think for them, it's a new way of delivering a service, so from physical to online. Um, but for Pate itself, it also really required a new way of doing business. So for, um, um, at least in, so completely with a new way of organizing the online content. So they really had to redesign, I think, their processes as well within the organization. So for them, it's also a process organization, uh, innovation. Um, and I think, where is it? Ah, Jens. Um, and so for them, it was also a kind of a business model innovation. Um, so where they said, for, well, there we have like new ways of making money, not only people coming to us, but also we delivering content to people. So for, for them, it was also a business innovation. Yeah. And that's quite important to realize because um, um, it, it doesn't necessarily always have to be the same innovation for every organization. So we used to think, we tend to think of innovation as oh, this is something that is completely new, but it can also be something old that only in, in one organization starts doing because Pate was not by far um, not the first one to, um, um, to develop online content. Um, I think they were relatively late with developing Pate Taus. Um, so watching cinema at home. But for them, it was an innovation. So it's also, so you can define innovation in terms of the market. So is this something new for everyone in the market? But you can also define innovation in more uh, from the organization's point, point of view. Um, and it's not always the same. Uh, so the difference between process and business model innovation. Well, um, if you think of Netflix, you know, for an, an online DVD rental service, um, but now they are they they don't rent out DVDs, but they are just an online video service. 
So for them, it was an entirely new process to go from physical DVDs towards um, online only, but it was not really a business model innovation because they still offer the same um, home rental and viewing of um, video. So, so for them, the change was not really a business model, but more of a um, process innovation. For Ote, Ote Thuis, it was, it was a business model innovation because for them, it was a, a completely new way of gaining revenue. Um, so um, people coming to them, watch a movie at a physical location. And now they are also an online content provider, um, which is a uh, business model change. But the difference, of course, is not always clear cut. But in general, if you have the same markets, the same people who buy your products um, uh, in the same field, it's not really a business model innovation. If you think of new ways of uh, earning money, of new ways that your product diffuses to the market, um, it's a business model innovation. For the exam, by the way, there are almost never correct answers, but it depends on your motivation. So if you would get a question, is this a business model or a process? Innovation really depends on your motivation, um, uh, whether the answer is correct. Um, so if you think of a new way of doing business, think of um, iTunes or think of Spotify. It was a completely new business model for you know, buying physical music in a store um, or to you know, downloading or downloading or actually um, um, listening to music online. So iTunes was really, and, and especially coupled with the iPod um, before and then, the, and then the iPhones we have now, it was really a, a, a new way of, um, uh, of doing business for, uh, uh, of, of listening to music. So this is really also a different way of making money. Also, if you, well, uh, I forgot what I, was, what I wanted to say. Well, well never mind. Um, so this is a new way of making money. Um, so this is a business model innovation, but it kind of relates also to the paradigm example. Um, and I'm going to give an example later on as well. Um, but let me start with this one. A paradigm um, innovation means that um, um, that your whole idea of what you are doing as an organization uh, changes um, so that you have a kind of a completely new, um, officially it's called that you have an, that the underlying mental model of the organization uh, changes. Um, more easily translated into if you as an organization develop an entirely new strategy for your organization or develop an entire new way of doing business, then you have a paradigm innovation. And if you think of um, how Uber has changed the taxi market or how Airbnb has changed the rental market, um, those are really examples of, of paradigm shifts in the way that we think of um, in the way that we think of um, booking a taxi or uh, booking a holiday. Um, because if you even remember how we used to do that before Airbnb um, and before Uber, it was completely different. Um, but if, I'll come back to your questions uh, in a moment. But then again, you know, if you look at this paradigm innovation like Uber, then it's also basically a business model innovation because it's also a new way of doing business. And then it's usually also also a um, almost always a service or um, product innovation. So usually if you have a completely, if, if you have a 
um, um, if you have an innovation that completely disrupts the market, um, it is a paradigm innovation, but that usually entails um, all different types of innovation. Um, but generally, let's go back here. You know, the, the impact of the innovation kind of changes um, uh, the further you go in this uh, figure. So a product service innovation can be relatively minor. So that they, uh, there's a new version of a product. Um, a project a process innovation usually entails you um, that you have to do business in a different way and organize your organization in a different way. A business model innovation is that you have to think of the way you do business. And a paradigm innovation is that you really have to think about the, the entire, entirety of your organization. So what are we as an organization? What do we want to accomplish? So the further you go in this figure here on screen, uh, I'm pointing that way because my screen is there. Um, but the further you go in the figure, um, the more impact the innovation has for an organization. And I think that is the most important thing to remember. So if you really have want to, so if you are an organization, you think you have a really disruptive ID, you basically have to redesign your organization or create a new organization for that innovation. But if your innovation is only incremental, then it may only require a new version of the innovation and only relatively little change. Uh, the difference between, I'm not sure if I already answered that question, the difference between process and business model innovation. So process is that you redesign your internal organization um, or the way that you deliver something to your customer. The business model innovation is that you find new ways of uh, making money or new ways for your innovation to sell. So for example, um, a business model innovation is that you, um, My creativity is lacking today, but but that you sell to a certain type of uh, um, of, of person of, or people. You have a certain market. Say you aim only for uh, you only have a business to business organization, and then suddenly you realize maybe we could also sell our products to consumers instead of businesses, and then you have a new business model. Uh, I think the answer by Spotify is uh, more popular, and iTunes has already been answered. So they're basically the same functionalities, of course, but indeed it's more it's, it's more accessible. Um, no, I think Uber was never a taxi company. Um, and the reason that iTunes kind of keeps it, so Apple kind of keep iTunes and everything closed is that the um, the entire strategy of Apple is focused on the um, on, on, the, on the platform that they have. So they really want to keep the people that use Apple tied to the whole Apple um, uh, ecology. So um, iTunes doesn't have to be bigger than um, Spotify as long as people will not shift from iTunes to Spotify. So they try to lock in their customers with a, with a, you know, a whole platform-based um, uh, ecosystem um, with uh, with an iPhone and a MacBook and iTunes and and whatever Apple always has so in order to lock in people in using um, in, in continuing to use um, Apple products. Yeah, and once you get sucked into uh, to Apple or Samsung for that matter, it's it's pretty difficult to um, to turn away and have a. a and, and, and start using a different platform. And that's designed on purpose, of course. Yeah, I, that's, yeah, that was the word I was looking for. Yeah, for them, brand loyalty is, uh, is more important than, so of course they, they, they have a big market share, um, but for them, brand loyalty and everything that comes with them, so just people spending a shitload of money on their platforms is more important than simply being the biggest.
Um, so this may be a good time for a break. Um, in, and then after break, so we now have the difference between uh, product service process and model paradigm. Um, after break, we'll discuss innovation typologies. And then I uh, can also give a more a few more examples of business servers, uh, uh, business, uh, sorry, product service and uh, other types of innovations. So let's first have a break. I would say 10 minutes and let's continue at 5.40 about. So see you in a bit. So let's first unmute myself and then continue the lecture. Um, uh, so before I was just uh, catching up on the, my WhatsApp messages and uh, I heard that there was a uh, fire alarm in a lecture, in an offline lecture today. Um, and there was also uh, a power outage in the queue today, this morning, I, I heard. So the benefits of uh, teaching from home um, well, <laughs> hopefully the power has to go out here. Uh, that was definitely a pity. So I hope maybe if things go well, which I doubt, then maybe we can have uh, physical lectures in the second half of the semester, but no guarantees. Um, so let's continue. They already, yeah, I already switched some recording again. Um, so now let's continue with different innovation typologies and in the uh, process I will explain them and I can explain a bit more about different types of innovation as well. Um, and basically innovation typologies are different ways of looking at different types of innovation. Um, and you could also call the different types of innovation that we discussed before an innovation typology. But there are I think two others which are quite useful um, in thinking about the concept of innovation. So the first one is very simple, um, and that's a, a distinction between uh, disruptive or radical innovations and, and incremental innovations. Um, a disruptive and radical innovation is the start of a whole new process or a whole new ID life cycle um, at an early stage of diffusion or adoption, more about that later. Um, while an incremental innovation is a, you know, really the term kind of defines itself. So it's more in the advanced stages of the product life cycle. There is a kind of dominant design and it usually involves continual improvements and upgrades. Okay, let me explain a little bit more. Um, so what does this mean? Right? I, my, there. Yeah. Um, so let's start with incremental innovation um, and start with the bottom bullet point. Often occur during the diffusion process in the form of continual improvements and upgrades. More about the diffusion process in the next lecture, but in general, an incremental innovation means that uh, a lot of people in your target market have adopted the innovation um, and you want to reach even more people in the market, so the final people who still haven't adopted your product, or you want people to basically rebuy the product. And in order to do so, you make incremental innovations in your product. So think of the new PlayStation, it's really broad as a oh, new PlayStation 5, completely redesigned, revamped, renewed, but it isn't. It's, it's just you know a better graphics card, a uh, different controller, but it's basically it has the same yeah it has the same basically the same market and it's the same people who will buy um or at least the same people you think in, in, which are in your market who will buy the new playstation yeah apple and iphone as well the new iphone is just an incremental innovation over the previous iphone it's not completely disruptive um and that's what's also meant by a dominant design. You know, after so many generations of mobile phones, we basically know what the best way of designing a phone is. 
So, so we know where the camera should be. We know what the interface should basically look like. So there is kind of a dominant design and there's not much more we can change in the design itself, except for minor uh, increments. And, then, then, and that is what is also meant with advanced stages of the product lifecycle. So, so we are with, I think with mobile phones kind of nearing the end of the regular mobile phone. And then we wait for a kind of a disruption in the mobile phones we use, you know, maybe with virtual reality, maybe the flip phones, um, maybe um, watches with an extendable screen, I don't know. So we're waiting for something disruptive. Yeah. So for Apple, the first iPad was disruptive. So then the, then the first iPhone was disruptive. Um, and I would say that not every new model was as was only incremental because of course some newer models were um were quite disruptive you know so the first iphone didn't have um uh, only had wi-fi but no phone um uh no 4 4g for example so that was kind of disruptive when they introduced that but in general the innovations in the iphone of the first one became more and more incremental and less disruptive And when the home button disappeared, that was also disruptive, but relatively disruptive, you know? So it's a scale from disruptive to incremental. And I, I would not call the disappearance of the physical home button a really, really disruptive uh, innovation. But, but, it was not only, but it was not purely incremental as well. So, um, yeah, so it was this. <laughs> Disruptive to your peace of mind. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, so it's a good example because um, it's a scale. You know, it's a one-dimensional scale from disruptive to incremental. So it's not always only incremental, or only disruptive. It can be somewhere in between. Um, so a disruptive or radical innovation, indeed, like the first iPhone, uh, and you mentioned your Spotify, um, the um, uh, smart watches, virtual reality goggles, electric cars, they um, start a new process. So it's a whole new adoption process. So for example, take electric cars. If you see how they adopt through um, the market, you really see that, okay, um, we started with an electric car. Um, the electric car itself was really disruptive. Um, every new version of an electric car is not purely incremental, but also not as disruptive, but we're still in the early stages of the new product life cycle. So still only a very select um, uh, percentage of people have, uh, have uh, or own an electric vehicle. Um, but you will see that in like 20 years or so, 80% um, of people have an electric car, and then you only basically see, well, We'll see minor increments in battery life, uh, layout, whatever. And then the next disruptive innovation would be um, completely autonomous cars, yes, in which um, have no steering wheel, for example. So that will be the next disruptive one. Uh, now, it's not only possible with products, also service. So think of um, uh, Spotify, uh, think of booking.com. Those really completely disrupted the existing market of for music and um, uh, holiday bookings, so I we're going to discuss. I'm going to discuss the example a bit more in later lectures, but 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 you can also have disruptive service uh, uh, innovations. Um, and you can see that if you talk about disruptive, it's it's usually always more than a simple product innovation. So when you have a really truly disruptive innovation, it's probably also a process and a business model and maybe even a paradigm innovation. While an incremental innovation is usually only a product, pro product or uh, service innovation and maybe process. So, so these are some, you, you don't have to remember everything by heart for uh, the exam, but you have to be able to think about what are the consequences for the organization with these two types of innovation. 
So when you look at the technology, it's the inno it, it, for incremental innovation, it kind of builds up, uh, builds upon existing technology. Well, for disruptive innovation, it is new technology. Um, if you look at the organization itself, for an incremental innovation, you don't need to change that much in your organization. You know, it, it fits in your organization. You, you need relatively new knowledge in your organization. Well, for a disruptive innovation, you probably need to hire different people. You need to have experts in different, in different fields than you're used to. Um, it requires new ways of working, uh, maybe new, even new departments in your organization. So um, whether you want to innovate or have to innovate incrementally or disruptive, it really affects your organization. And it also affects your market. So um, incremental, you have basically have your existing customer base and you just sell them, you just sell them a new uh, a new Samsung phone. Um, well, for disruptive, you have to really start over. So you have to again explain to your existing and to your new customers why this is a useful product. So you have ident you have to identify new customer needs, um, and customers need to learn or relearn. How to use the innovation um, and so it requires a whole new way of dealing with your customers a whole new way of marketing and again of course you can remember this by heart for the exam but you can also logically think about okay what will happen to my customers and to my organization uh, if an innovation is disruptive or incremental um, Talk about the music industry. Um, if, if you think about the music industry and how that has changed over the past 20 years or so, you see that the whole shift towards online music is a basically a complete paradigm shift. Um, so it's not only a new service. So instead of you know buying a CD, um, you 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 don't buy CD, but you just buy a subscription to listen to every to all music. Um, so it's not only a new service, but it's also really a paradigm shift um, in, in many ways. So um, two examples. Um, uh, uh, bands or, or singer songwriters, whatever, they used to get a whole lot of their revenue from sales of their music, you know, just people buying CDs or records. Um, so a large part of the artist's income would come from selling music. Now, artists don't earn, well, they earn next to nothing um, from their music. So the way they earn is from different types of revenue. So they mostly earn from concerts or uh, on marketing opportunities. Uh, you know, selling t-shirts, those kind of things. Um, so that's where they, how they earn their money nowadays, for the most part. Um, so there's really a paradigm shift in, in the way that, that artists and all the organizations involved need to think about ways to make money and ways to organize. Um, another example, which is not business or market related, is the way that artists think about music. Um, so um, um, a long time ago, um, artists would release a record and the records that they would release would be a story. You know, think of an al album by Pink Floyd or uh, whatever old uh, band you know, keep in mind now, you have in mind now. So if they would release a record it would be like a coherent record and it would be a story nowadays you know you don't really listen that much to records so you can you can still can but you see that uh, artists now release more they release music so they release songs and sometimes they release an album but they also release songs so the way that artists think about music has also changed a bit uh, because of the uh, changes in the music industry so it's not only a, a, a paradigm shifts in business, but also maybe even a paradigm shift in thinking about music altogether. Yeah, and of course, all artists also earn through YouTube and Insta, but I, I don't really know how the earnings through those platforms compare to 
earnings uh, via concerts, for example. I, I can imagine that it's that the direct sales of music, or and, and nowadays, which is direct uh, streams of music, either via Spotify or YouTube or whatever. I, I think it's it's less of a share of their total income than uh, than it was before. But of course, there are other ways of earning through YouTube. You know, uh, this video is sponsored by Skillshare, uh, which also brings in a bit of money. I did absolutely not know that there was a mini docu in Netflix. I am definitely going to watch that. Thanks. Um, so this is really an example of a very disruptive innovation. I mean, you completely uh, overhaul the way we do business. We look at music, we download music, we pay for music, etc. cetera. Um, while this is an example of the other end, it's a bit of an old slide, but even so because they still all have a home button, but even now it's not that much of a change. Uh, so that's one way of looking at innovations, incremental versus disruptive. Um, and then the second typology I want to discuss is, um, well, basically what they do is they um, distinguish between two types of disruptive and incremental. And I think that's pretty useful as well. Um, so Abernathy and Clark, they say, for, well, you, have, you can have incremental and disruptive innovations along two dimensions. So first of all, you can really think about new technologies and new structures, so uh, new processes, uh, new services. Um, or you can think of incremental changes in um, technologies and product services, etc. So that's the disruptive incremental on one dimension. But they say you can also think from it from the consumer perspective. So you can be disruptive in that you want to reach an entirely new market with your products. Um, or you can innovate in such a way that you focus on an existing market. And that basically gives four different types of innovation, uh, niche, architectural, revolutionary, and regular. And to start with regular, this would be an example of a regular innovation so you aim for the same market um, and it is minor increments in technology um, but you can have more so for example the first like we discussed so the first release of the um, iphone and ipad was truly um sorry um was truly architectural um, so it was a completely new technology and the market was also completely new. And that does not mean that you reach entirely different customers, but you really had to um, start over again. So you had to relearn and re-explain and, uh, and, and explain to your customers why this is a good innovation. Um, so the first... Um, iPhone, iPad, I think is a very good example of an architectural innovation. So it both was a new technology and it was an, a reintroduction of the technology in the market. Um, let's do niche creation next. Uh, yes, niche creation. So this is an example of a tablet which is specifically focused on, you can guess, children. Um, so it, it's not new technology. So it's basically, you know, you, you, you get an iPad, you, you may make it pink and you uh, install a few other applications and that's it. Um, so it doesn't really require any new forms of technology, etc. But it does relate to a new market. Um, so it is aimed towards a completely different market than a regular iPhone or iPad. Um, so this is an example of a niche creation. So you have an existing technology, and then you find a new market for that technology.
So for example, if you would invent a phone that older people can actually easily use, that would also be a niche creation. So relatively minor change in technologies, new market. Um, so we already explained this, this is a regular innovation. So um, rather conservative in both um, technological innovation as in um, trying to attain new markets. So it's just a, an incremental, really incremental innovation. Um, and I, I think the most simple example of a, um, uh, of a, um, a, a revolutionary uh, innovation is the change from regular typewriter to electronic typewriter to using a word processor and then printing stuff out on your computer. Um, so it is a, or, nah, maybe the, maybe um, the transformation from um, vinyl records, you know, the old black records, which are hip right now, um, to compact discs, the shiny silver discs, which you may see when you're at your parents' house. Uh, that was really a revolutionary innovation. So it did exactly the same as records did, um, but it was a completely new technology. So it required a complete disruption of, 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 techn of technology, completely new technology, a new way of producing, uh, new companies involved. Um, but the whole market, the compact, the compact this was aimed to, was exactly the same as, um, as the previous market. So, I think that is an example of a revolutionary innovation. And this is useful because, yeah, why? This is useful because I think, um, because it shows that an innovation can also be um, a truly new, truly is that best word? Yeah, can also be truly new if it's only aimed towards a new market. So. Um, Again, we tend to think of innovation. Oh, this is new technology, a new product, and especially if it is if it is something like an object. Um, but you can also be very innovative if you if you are able to sell something that already exists in a way to a new market. So innovation is not only invention, but it's also the market value, and that's why I think that this um, um, uh, matrix typology is useful. When do you use the? Yeah, so floppy disk to CD is also revolutionary, right? That's the easy question. Uh, when do you use the first typology? So, or when do you use the second one? I think it's almost always better to use this one. Um, but for me, it's way easier to first explain incremental versus disruptive, and then so going from one dimension to two dimensions, instead of immediately starting with uh, incremental versus disruptive. Um, so, so in general, I think it's very useful when you think of innovations to think both of the innovation itself, but also think about who's actually going to, going to use this. Um, so, so I think maybe the second one would be always preferable above the first, um, though I do think that you know, if you want to develop your own company and if you have to pitch your ID to, uh, to an investor, it may be better to pick the former one because that's easier explained. And that's basically, you know, that's the, to, to give an example of how, um, how theories work, that is the trade-off we always have when we develop theories, not only for something uh, like this, but every the theory we have. So we can invent a very simple theory like incremental versus disruptive. Um, so it's quite simple to understand, um, but it doesn't capture reality as well as the as this uh, typology. So this is a more difficult theory because it has two dimensions of one. Um, so we can capture more of reality with this, but it is a bit more complex than the first theory. And that's basically always a trade-off that we have in developing theories in, uh, in science. 
sorry, short sidestep in the scientific process. Uh, this is what we explained. Uh, then I think this is probably the last thing we do. So I want to explain a bit about innovation management. So we have all these different types of innovations. Um, how do we handle this as an organization? So during the lecture, I, all, I already gave a bunch of examples. Um, so uh, if you have a disruptive innovation, you have to um, also think about the way you do business. Um, and that's innovation management. And for us, communication information science technologies, while well, the topic of innovation is interesting, but we also need to think about, okay, how will this work in an organization? You know, if, if you end up as a uh, communication consultant in an organization, you need to be able to think of, okay, there is something new going on. How can I um, sell this to the people in the organization and how it, will it change the organization? And that's innovation management. Um, I don't know why I repeat this one. Uh, this is more useful. Um, so consider if you have an architectural innovation, um, which is completely um, uh, disruptive, um, that would require an organization with certain characteristics in order to be successful. So if you have an organization which is really formal, uh, very structured, very process oriented, uh, people who are not willing to change, then an architectural innovation will be very difficult to implement in the organization because people in the organization will think, oh, well, but this requires a new way of working. I don't want to work in a new way or I can't because I'm really um, immersed in a certain way of doing my work. Um, so if you have an architectural innovation, it kind of requires a certain type of organization. Um, so, for example, Apple is a quite an innovative uh, company, and uh, even probably some parts of Apple are not innovative uh, at all, but where the actual innovation happens, those are probably very open, um, uh, and uh, people who are willing to change, and not necessarily open to the outside world, but open to other ideas. So while on the other hand, a regular innovation, you know, simply the new version of a phone or a new television, for example, um, that fits best in a structure of an organization, which is really um, mechanistic. So, okay, we have certain machines or certain projects or we have certain processes in the organization. So a certain way of doing business and we can you know, buy a better robot, we can implement minor changes to the way we do business, um, which is the next version of the product we have. Um, so, it re so, um, so it works best in a more mechanistic type of organization uh, with a culture which is not really open, but can really be a bit more eternally focused. Um, we will discuss the exact culture types in the lecture on uh, structure and culture. Um, but you can basically see that if you want to stimulate uh, yeah, innovation in an organization, you have to think about, is my organization suitable for the innovation? And that's why you sometimes see that if an organization wants to do something new, they build up a new organization, so like a spin-off of the organization, especially for the new project, because the innovation simply would not fit in the structure and culture of the existing organization. Um, yeah, and uh, it's also different for niche and revolutionary innovation. So niche innovations are, are geared towards a different market. So you want people to be a bit more open-minded and to focus on the market. Um, but of course, you want to be, be a bit more structured and professional in the way your organization functions. Um, a revolutionary organization is a new technology, so it would be good if you have a structure which uh, can focus on new technologies, but, uh, or at least a new versions of the technology. Um, 
Um, but you don't necessarily have to have at the outward look for new markets for a revolutionary innovation because the innovation is focused on the same market. So um, again, it's not necessary, of course, though you can, it's not necessary to know this by heart for the exam or know this by heart uh, if it's relevant for you in your work, but it's just something that you need you need to learn, so you need to learn, okay, this innovation um, would be best suitable for this type of your organization. So you, we to, you should be able to like logically deduce it instead of remembering it by heart. And that's basically the same with this slide um, and with the next slide as well, by the way. Um, you can think of, okay, how do we, and um, if you want to stimulate innovation in an organization, how can we do that? Okay, now we need a culture that encourages creativity. Uh, we need to have managers who are able to not, you know, focus on the micro aspects of managing, but who is able to, you know, support, uh, uh, like more support than manage. Um, like set goals, be involved, but not micromanage because that would be detrimental for innovation. Um, you need to have people who can communicate well which is, I think, the most important thing in an organization, um, who can um, build upon each other's work. Uh, you need the resources. Uh, you need to have, well, you need to have a culture that, that allows and not impedes creativity, etc. cetera. Um, so there are a lot of things you have to take into account in the organization in order to stimulate innovation. Um, this is, another one from another book which basically says the same well, you have to think about the structure the culture and the people in an organization um but again it's absolutely not necessary to remember this by heart it's only that you have to logically think about okay what will happen to my organization so if if i have some kind of new product which requires a whole new way of doing business um will that fit the culture of the organization or, or do we need to set up an entirely new organization do we need to adopt the strategy of the organization do we need to hire more people um, so what internal changes in the organization does the innovation require um, and like i said that's the main premise of this course so it's not only thinking about new products not only thinking about technology but really thinking about the interplay between innovations, technology, and the organizational business. Um, because that, that is what we are good at as communication and information science students. At least that is what we will be good at. Well, if you graduate, when you graduate, sorry. So in general, so these are all all examples of the way that an organization needs to adapt or needs to accommodate innovations. In general, um, there is kind of a tension always between um, the organization and between innovation and creativity in the organization. Because you as an organization are most efficient when your day-to-day -day operations are most stable. So when you have a certain way of doing business, you can optimize that, um, or you have optimized that. And, and usually that is best accomplished in a very controlled environment. So this is what we do as an organization. These are our customers. Uh, this is the process we have clear. But innovation requires something else. So innovation requires people to know, think about, think outside of the box. So think outside of your traditional organization okay what we do on a day-to-day -day basis is that actually enough in the long term or do we need or, or do we want to or need to develop new uh, ways of working or new products etc so innovation requires the development of new products and services and, and requires the room of flexibility to try out try out new things so you can imagine there's always a tension between the day-to-day -day functioning of an organization and creativity. And that's why organizations have you know, R&D departments. That's why they have R&D budgets. That's why they have different project teams that work on new ideas. But, and, but that's why organizations also have day-to-day -day operations. Um, and 
what is really interesting, I think, is really trying to manage that tension um, in the organization. So if you are uh, the chief uh, resource and development officer, or if you are the chief information or technology officer in an organization, um, you need to be able to balance that. So you need to have attention for, okay, this is how the organization functions, this is efficient, but we need to offer room to a group of people or to a certain department to do things in another way. Um, and explaining to people, and especially to upper management, um, that this is sometimes required is um, usually a, uh, a challenge. But you've already learned some tactics, you know, you have already learned to talk about uh, different types of innovation. You've uh, you learned to talk about, okay, this is a new market, this is a new technology. So you already have some of the uh, theoretical tools in order to manage this, uh, uh, this process. I think, uh, yeah, so, so in conclusion for this part, um, innovations are often uh, technological innovation. So even a process innovation usually involves some kind of new technology that you implement, you know, a new kind of system which would to work more efficiently. Um, so innovations often have a kind of technology aspect to them. Um, and innovation always affects how organizations need to organize themselves. So new information systems in an organization. So if you have a new information system that um, handles um, all student communication um, or handles all student grades, you know, so we use OSIRIS for that, but that, that system is relatively new. It really changes the way the organization functions. So, um, for example, for us, OSIRIS was introduced, I think, two or three years ago, and it requires and required a lot of organizational change. So months and months of implementation, months of training. Um, so, so it was a, OSIRIS is really a service innovation, so a new way of tackling student information and student grades, grades, but it was also a new information technology and it required the organization to do our organization to do business in a completely other way. Um, also think about social media in an organization. You know, it has changed customer interactions a lot. So even a relatively minor innovation as, okay, um, we used to do customer interaction mostly by phone and by email, but now customers can also reach us via chat or via Twitter. It requires you to think about, 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 about your organization as well. So you need to be much faster in replying. So you need to have a um, customer care center which can handle um, that way of doing business. I think I'm going to discuss all the other examples here like RFID and technology and social media uh, in the lecture on uh, information systems because the, uh, it's a... Uh, I think it's a good idea to come back to innovations and technology at that point. Um, so in the last 10 minutes, I'll try to make it five, um, but I want to explain a bit about open innovation, so just the basics. Um, um, because it's quite... Um, so I think the major thing, so the major takeaway of open innovation compared to what we discussed in the whole lecture before is that we discussed innovation as something that mainly happens within the organization. So you have an R&D department um, and then you come up with a new ID and you kind of have, you know, have that funnel of innovation and then you try to come up with, okay, how will this innovation um, affect the market or is it even a new market? Is it a new market? Um, and then you try to implement the innovation. So if you look at how innovation nowadays happens in an organization, it's, it's way more uh, diffuse. So um, on the left, you see the traditional innovation model, closed innovation, but nowadays you see that the boundaries of the firm are, so the boundaries of the organization are less and less clear. So for example, you, 
um, you ask people outside of the organization to develop an innovation. Um, you work together with other organizations to develop the innovation. Um, you steal an ID from another organization. Um, and also the other way around. So um, you develop the innovation in-house in your own organization, but it turns out that it's way better to sell the innovation or to create a spin-off. Um, could it be that someone is not on mute? Then, uh... I don't know. Um, better. Um, so that's what we call open innovation. And so more formal, it's in, in open innovation, we as organizations realize, okay, the smart people do not only work for us, so we have to tap into knowledge outside of our organization, for example, in external research and development. Um, so we don't have to develop the technology in-house, we don't discover it ourselves, but we um, can um, outsource that. Um, we don't necessarily have to commercialize the innovation, um, but we can build a better business model so basically, this all relates to, okay, we don't necessarily need to have the technolo technological innovation first in-house and then think about, sorry, uh, we don't necessarily have to have the technical invention first and then think about the innovation process, um, but it can be more diffuse, so across organizations or the other way around. So uh, that you first try to think of a business model and then think of an innovation, etc. And that's what we in general call open innovation. Um, and you have a lot of different things which, which, are, which fall below the main category of uh, innovation. You know, so um, uh, co-creation is that you work with other organization or other people um, um, in, in developing an innovation. Um, crowdsourcing, I think I have some definition here, Crowdsourcing means that you um, uh, that you basically ask the general public to come up with solutions. Um, uh, user innovation is um, not the general public, but more maybe maybe a more specific group of users. I don't necessarily have to remember that, um, but you have a lot of different ways of innovating outside of the boundaries of an organization. Um, and I think to end with um, what maybe um, I think of a fun addition to think about open innovation is to give an example of how you can use the general public for your own innovation within the organization. Um, so if you think of um, Wikipedia or Reddit, um, th they really innovate. Uh, so, or their innovation is that they don't actually do anything themselves. Well, some things, um, but they really ask the users, for example, Reddit asked you to um, post things on Reddit, to vote on things on Reddit, um, so they become more popular. So it's really about knowledge discovery. And uh, so, so this is what called knowledge discovery and management. So it's gathering and processing existing information um, by users. Um, so this basically means that everyone um, uh, uh, inside and outside of the organization can participate in building uh, knowledge. So that's, that's one interesting way of knowledge discovery. Um, the second one is, broadcast search what many organizations do now is they try to when they see a certain issue they ask a question to a wider audience in order to find a solution for a certain issue um, and you even have platforms which do that like innocentives so, so they post challenges online and um, uh, people can um, uh, send in proposals to solve those challenges so I, I, a couple of years ago, a thesis student of mine actually won, I think, 10,000 euros with a, uh, a 
uh, an innovation uh, challenge, uh, which was an example of a broadcast church, uh, search. Um, so a, a consultancy organization, they are, they had a, um, um, they had a challenge in which they asked people to come up with solutions for uh, sharing knowledge um, in, in a uh, quite traditional organization. Um, and their thesis students were just writing a thesis and doing an internship at another organization in the Netherlands uh, under my supervision. Uh, and he, he, um, he pitched his ID um, based on his thesis for that organization. And he won. Um, so he won the challenge. Um, and then they implemented, well, at least part uh, of the solutions he came up with. So which I think is a very interesting way of you know, innovating outside your organization. So the third example of crowdsourcing, and then we call it with so is, is peer vetted creative production, as it is called officially. So this is, you know, getting the crowd, getting the public so far that they innovate for you. Um, so the example here is Patachi Yopi, which I think is still the best example because it was a um, it, it was a contest in which people could pitch ideas for um, a new um, flavor of potato chips. And then other people could vote on the ID, um, and then they chose the best IDs. Um, yeah, and finally, I think another fun example of crowdsourcing is distributed human intelligence tasking, um, which is getting us so far as to um, uh, help an organization or help a computer in um, um, in, in processing data. So, for example, you, you know that I'm not a robot check boxes that you have to check and then you have to. Uh, um, you know, you have to point out all the traffic lights. Um, or all the I, I just today I had to point out all the palm trees in a certain photo. Um, and that is used that information to train algorithms for image recognition, for example, for uh, automated cars or for Google image recognition. So that's a way of innovating. That's a way of, of using the crowd um, for a task that computers cannot do well. Um, so, so these are, I think, a, a bunch of interesting examples of, uh, of how you can um, how you can innovate outside of your organization. You know how you can get other people so far as to help you in um, in innovating. Um, in the lecture on um, uh, virtual organizations, I will go into more detail because I now do it quite quickly. Um, but there we have more examples of, uh, of this crowdsourcing. So for now, I would say it has been enough. I hope we can enjoy the weather a bit more um, today. And next week, we, can, we will continue with the fusion of innovation. So we'll talk about how innovations transfer to the market uh, throughout the market. So for now, I want to thank you very much. Thanks for your attention. And I will uh, see you online uh, next week. Don't forget to sign up for a group. And, and thank you very much.